know you're uh, in for a good evening if it requires two introductions. Uh, my name is Bill Byer, as was said. I have the honor of introducing what I've been wondering will reveal itself as either a poet and is a musical accompaniment, or two musicians and their poet sidekick. I'm not sure how it's going to A book launch uh, should, by rights, give top billing to the poet. Yes. <laughs> but I've seen these flashy accordionists in action before, so watch out. I'll remind you that uh, publicity for tonight described Barton Sutter as an author and a playwright who received the Minnesota Book Award not once, not twice, but three times. Woohoo! And who served as the first poet laureate of Duluth. The younger Sutter brother, Ross, annually headlines ASI's Midsummer Celebration and Family Christmas Show, as well as the Swedish Midsummer Festival in New York City. His regular performances in schools all over the Northland have earned him a prestigious Sally Irvine Award. When Art Fjornjeld isn't practicing as a professional carpenter, and his clients say he's actually getting pretty good at the practice. <laughs> when not a carpenter, he's living up to a family tradition of music making that's led him from the Scandinavian Hotshots to the Minnesota Scandinavian Ensemble to performing solo and in groups at festivals such as Kodiak, Alaska's Scandinavian Festival, Bismarck, North Dakota's Fest Fest, and Brainerd Lakes, Minnesota's Miswastema. These, my friends, are genuine Scandinavian Americans. <laughs> the Sutters cut from the forests of Sweden, northern Minnesota, <laughs> and Bjorn yelled, risen from the seas of Norway and the grassland seas of North Dakota. <laughs> I'm betting they'll make good on the title Nordic Accordion Poems by uh, in a Scandinavian Mood, which brings us together tonight and promises both poetry and music. Oh, there's one of those ones. <laughs> to temper the excitement sure to rise, the boys will break partway for an intermission, as has been said. Get set to tap your feet as you join me in welcoming this hearty threesome. Bill was my English professor. <laughs>
should you be moved to tears, it would be okay for those of you of Nordic descent to say it's my allergy to accordions. <laughs> uh, we're also here to celebrate my new book, Nordic Accordions. Published by Norton Stillman's Noden Press. Norton Stillman is a legend now in publishing in the upper Midwest. Norton, where are you? You're here, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Why you stand up and take a round of applause for a long life of long, hard, brilliant work? Thank you so much. It's a richly satisfying night for me because um, this is this book is really the project of a lifetime. I the first really good poem that I wrote, uh, I was 27 years old, I was taking a, uh, adult ed lessons at uh, this very place, KSI, with a beautiful na uh, woman named Sonia Algren, uh, whose looks and classy dressing made it very easy for a young man to come to uh, that class most weeks. But I stood up after writing that poem and said, you know, that's better than I know how to write. I don't know how I did that. And that's the drug that keeps you coming back to do more. And I said, well, I'm going to do something with this. I think I will explore that Scandinavian material. That was a sort of a resolution or a covenant. And then I promptly didn't do it because I didn't want to be pigeonholed. You know? Little did I know that if I had persisted, that could have been my brand. But I didn't know about those things. But anyway, uh, here we are tonight, and uh, I feel like I'm bringing it all back home to the place where a lot of this, a lot of this started. <clears throat> Finally, I want to thank this guy, my brother, Ross, to whom this book is dedicated. Uh, I, he has my high and deep admiration. Here is a guy who, for one thing, started out in places named Ross Hamlin Town in Petersburg. Uh, and has managed to make a living as a singer all his life, singing his head off. It's amazing he has any head left at all. <laughs> yeah. So, I thought I would start out with the uh, first poem in the book, which is uh, based on a teaching story that I heard Tom McGrath tell twice in public, and it's also included in a documentary on him, called uh, The Movie at the End of the World. And I love that story so much. It's been so helpful to me. I thought surely he had made a poem out of this, but I couldn't see that he ever did, and I thought somebody ought to do it, and I was the guy for the job. So here it is, The Immigrants, a story by Tom McGrath. And then these guys are going to follow up with uh, immigrant, uh, some immigrant music, a Swedish tune and, uh, and a Finnish tune, I think, yeah. So uh, they are both appropriately melancholy. You know, that mood that we all love so much. I understand that in Finnish, uh, if you're an Eskimo, you know, in Inuit there's a, uh, 67 words for snow. In Finnish there are 192 words for melancholy. And we can go into that at a later stage of Thursday. Have you heard the parable that Tom McGrath, who felt at home beneath Dakota skies, worked up to tell us why we're still so lost? Norwegians. Norwegians in their canvas-covered wagon creak across the endless prairie grass when suddenly Lakota braves appear like distant birds along the skyline far behind them. Worried, Pa whips up the horses, but the birds are ponies closing fast. The wagon's way too slow, and so the family dumps the pedal organ off the back. There goes the sacred music from the last 300 years. Still too much weight, but who needs Shakespeare in translation here? The Edda also goes, and Ibsen's too newfangled anyhow. They're rolling now, the sweaty horses flecked with foam, but still the braves are closing, so the Norskis chuck the chest with all the porcelain. Kersmash! No more fancy dinners now. They fling the Bible, too, all those these and thous. The wagon shakes, about to fly apart, the Indians are fading, 
but the quickest still persist and Ma can see their faces streaked with paint. The children help her push poor Grandma out the back. And there she goes, heart wheeling through the sky. Farewell, more and more. They crest the hill and shudder, jounce along, the wagon empty, having ditched the braves and rattle on another day, arriving finally at their claim of new world dirt and grass. No history to burden them and nothing in their hands. That's the myth McGrath made up to say why. Even though we're fat from stolen land, we know somehow we're missing something, something thrown away. And everything we've worked so hard to win feels thin as dust the next ferocious wind will blow away.
Finn, even some Icelandic on the streets, around kitchen tables in town, outside the dime store. And uh, it all seemed a little mysterious to us, and I got imprinted with some of those sounds early on. Uh, so that's gone along with us and probably got piqued our curiosity and got us going down the trail that we did. We get back there, uh, Ross gets back to that area a lot, and uh, I love going up into that region with him when I get to say such things as, when was the last time you were in Ross, Ross? <laughs> uh, you want to drive out to Ross, Ross? For a that's the idea of a real wild party. <laughs> you know, to say something like that. Keeps me happy. Uh, <laughs> I've wondered some about the origin of uh, ethnic awareness and, you know, consciousness of history and kids. And this is one of my earliest awakenings or something. Strange doings at Ross Elementary, 1956. <clears throat> when I was a kid on the Canadian border, the grade school in the village there was plural, schools, because the farm folks round about had simply hauled in clabbered houses on their flatbed trucks, set them on foundations in a field, and hired teachers. Each teacher taught two grades, two grades per house, grades one through six, with one house left to serve as cafeteria. They built a rink with a warming house, and bingo, problem solved. Everything was painted white because the winters were so long no one could think in any other color. <laughs> the teachers helped us lace our skates for recess and called us back to work by standing on their porches swinging bells. Sometime along in May when ice had finally melted in the rink we cut rubber band boats out of plywood and sent them puttering across the muddy ocean. There were strange doings at that school. One day, a classmate brought a flag for show and tell, scarlet, with a blue and white cross on its side. This was the flag of Norway, and he'd fashioned it to show that he was more than just American. He was Norwegian, too. That flag inflamed us, made us crazed with jealousy and we spent every recess chasing him while Norway fluttered in the wind he made by running wild. That night, our houses stayed up late, brightened by the sound of bed sheets ripping, <coughs> our humming as we colored them and tacked the colors onto strips of lath. Next day, the cloakroom bristled with our standards. The red and white of Denmark, the sun and sky of Sweden, the sky and snow of Finland and Germany was there, and Iceland looked like Norway inside out. <laughs> At recess, first and second graders of Ross Elementary burst from the schoolhouse like patriotic banshees in high-speed parade, flags rippling in the breeze as we snaked around the schoolyard, ran full tilt, ecstatic, tears streaking from our eyes because the wind because our grandparents, because we were carried away by who knows what. A fundamental lesson in geography, phys ed, war, and just plain odd behavior, <laughs> which has lasted me my whole life long. <laughs>
piqued our interest. She was a fabulous storyteller. She was the last living survivor of the Hinckley Fire, which means that she was an infant in arms, you know, when the train pulled out. And her story of her experience as an infant grew more and more and more detailed as the years went on. She was a reviser. I think I learned lots of lessons. Sky. On a bright blue day in October, I go visit Grandma at 620 Cedar over here, who was so old her skin looks like the left sock. She was not enchanted with that line when I first showed her that Nor the next. She is half bald, but hardly unhappy. Air conditioning, color TV, more than enough money saved to purchase her coffin, a stone for the grave. She says that she's never had it so good. She pours the bitter, eternal coffee, and in one of her goofier moods, introduces the homemade cookies by singing a little song about sweets and how they make you thick and fat. So bleer do shuck go fat, so bleer do shuck go fat, O dopa Danny ho no so bleer do shuck go fat. Her voice is thin and scratchy, like a worn out 78. At her age, 87, she ought to be thinking of heaven, but she tells me an off-color story and warms the room with laughter. Once again, I ask her the secret of her longevity. Once again, she tells me, just keep breathing. <laughs> she has outlived everyone, surviving her husband, her family, and friends, and known the final revenge of outlasting all of her enemies. She's almost free of desire. Through her high-rise window, I can see the topmost twigs of two tra trees and the sky that simply goes and goes. I think her mind must be like that, or like some windswept pasture. It's the strangest feeling, Barton, when all your friends are gone. Dunk is dead, Myrtle is dead, and Furley, everyone I grew up with, and we used to have such fun. I leave her alone, still hanging on, a tough leaf the wind left behind. Driving home, I'm oddly excited by the horses grazing the green hillsides and the velvet cattails lining the road, the scepters that rule the other kingdom, and the certainty that a day will come when I too will get to be old and die. And I notice the brassy aspens and the birches are shining like brandy and the lakes look as deep as the sky.
reciting their whole genealogical tree to you half, and then my cousin Bob's kid, who was, you know, he lives now. I, uh, I, I try to keep an eye out for stories, and uh, I, I came across a, a, something in a scrapbook in a <clears throat> lodge outside of Lutzen, and uh, it was interesting enough that it turned over and over in my head, and this poem came up after a while. So, based on something real and, and fictionalized a bit. Halver Halverson. Here's to Halver Halverson, the Swedish boy who escaped his foster folks and on his own slipped aboard a ship. Sailing out from Yuttaboria, he breathed the clean salt breeze, farvel to the mire of manure, the claustrophobic trees. Halver sailed the world around, beyond his fantasies. He watched a fellow sailor drown. He learned some Japanese. He heard a superb soprano sing, the jungle squawk and howl, the growl and groan of rigging when the weather turned foul. But edging up to middle age and wanting something safe, Halver signed for a decent wage to work the Great Lakes on the last commercial sloop to sail the broad freshwater seas. Bad luck when pelting rain and hail blew up, the gale increased. A wave washed Halver overboard in boiling seas. No hope. But flailing, Halver reached out for and grabbed the trailing rope. He took a job at a new resort down shore from Grand Marais, and he had cause to thank the Lord because he earned his pay by rowing out a little skiff to pluck trout from the net well sheltered by the granite cliffs, the time for cigarettes. By noon, he'd have his catch laid out before him on the lawn and crank the old Victrola loud. He got that from the lodge. Oliver conducted, knife in hand, as heartsick music played and gulls whirled round but didn't land their wings like silver blades. His knife would snick and slip a fish and he'd strip out the offal. The guests would hush each other, hiss. Is that Italian opera? <laughs> a powerful, pure soprano filled the pine sweet air. Oh, mio babino caro. They wondered where they were. Here's a song of the Lake Superior written by the poet of the evening.
Yeah, some do beef. Oh. Yeah. Well, not in the Monster. Yeah, right. Gut bombs. They're gray. You know, when you cook them, they're gray. And uh, what's left in the pot afterwards would wallpaper about six rooms. <laughs> But you put drawn butter on them and they're fantastic. And they're better the next day still, so. Uh, Kringla, you know, it's kind of a sweet bread pretzel. Is that fair enough? It's not a pretzel. I, I said kind of. I said kind of. It's soft. Uh, what, anything else here you might need translation on? Well, uh, uh, respicaca. That's like kumla, only kind of squished down in a pan with bacon. And, and baked, yes. Baked rather than boiled. So. All right. What happened after the kumla was served? At the Norwegian American family, Uftefest. After the prayer in the grandmother tongue. After the kumla, sauced with drawn butter. The kringla, the fruit soup, the krumkaka. A sweet so fragile it shatters in your hand. Followed by coffee and hymns in the language of lost mountains, glaciers, and fjords. One son-in-law, a mongrel mix of German, French, and God knows what, was heard to grumble, I think this ethnic stuff is overdone. We're all Americans now, for Christ's sake. To which his Norsky brother-in-law replied, I see. <laughs> A phrase which, translated from the Midwestern, a highly cryptic dialect, means, I hear you but might not agree. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Probably not. <laughs> I'll have to think about this thought that you've expressed so recklessly a dozen times or more before I get back to you, which I probably won't. <laughs> you are free to think what you like and act accordingly. But as for me and my house, we are still awfully fond of the respicaca. <laughs> Standing there with 
tears in my eyes, and afterwards we get to talking with him, and he said, yeah, well, uh, I grew up in a home where they talked Swedish, you know, so I could talk Swedish, and when all the old timers started to die, uh, I could sing, too, and so they'd come to me and say, would you sing Yahar and Ben? And I sang that at 127 hymns. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll follow this with that. <clears throat> with that hymn, and then we uh, should all stand up for a while, and we'll take 10, 15 minutes and come back here. Buy my book. <laughs> Funeral rites. He met her at a funeral. It might have been a dance had they been younger. They were not. Despite the circumstance, he couldn't help but notice her and thought he'd take a chance. At the post interment basement lunch, he gave her his best glance. Her face was wrinkled, sure enough, but also soft and smooth. She had a low, gentle voice, like mothers used to soothe. He told a story on their friend. She laughed, and he rejoiced. This woman might be past her prime, but definitely choice. <laughs> Turned out that she was Danish. Just like his, her eyes were blue. And what a wild coincidence. She liked coffee, too? <laughs> He felt his Elsa wouldn't mind. Her passing had been long ago. Now this pretty woman was affecting him like song. She had nice manners, liked to laugh, but kept it dignified and decent as a person should, their good friend having died. They walked out to the parking lot. He asked if he might call someday to take her out for pie. She wasn't shy at all. So. That was the beginning there. He found his second wife. He met her at a funeral. That brought him back to life. Since Bart's been reading that poem at our shows, we've had three couples come up to us and admit that they met at funerals. <laughs> I have a friend. Your and then some else can make so who can't hang the whole say. Oh, close it to
for having fun. Hope you are too. 10, 15 minutes and we'll be back up here. Ancestral memories brought me here, the dream and lilting words, the homesick ache of kitchen talk, small boy I overheard. Small boy himself, my granddad left a century back and more, fared forth with family from Yuttaboria for the mist of America. My family has the diary his father tried to write, three pages long, the story stops as Sweden sinks from sight. Seasick, maybe, or racked by doubts about his headstrong deed. When he resumes, it's all mundane, the price of tools and seed. We know what's missing in that book. The heave and toss, the wind, the waves, the retching as they thought of those they left behind. The generations rose and fell, our Svenska flickered out. But some old song insisted on the tickets that I bought. We circle the lake by a rental car and cross the causeway where dead men used to strain with oars. Prodigal son, I'm here. Although I can't say why for sure. To somberly stroll the graveyard and trace my last name carved in stone. The dream of home, rock hard. We find our temporary house reserved for cultural workers. A welcome note, food in the fridge, fish row and Knackerbrook. The living room has a fireplace with kindling set to light. Upstairs, a porch looks everywhere. But I want second sight. Why would anyone want to leave? We wonder as we walk beneath dark pines and glimmering birch. Then realize with a shock, potatoes that cover a small field can't be spud. It's June. And of course, a closer look reveals no harvest but brown stones. Back at the house, we murmur and snoop where Margaret and Suzanne have left their notes on the dialect in a dark blue hand. The language of the old folks here is vanishing, it seems, like bream that break beyond the net, phosphorescent gleams. After supper, I stroll alone down to the village pier, 
where shadowy men have gathered to launch the dream they built this year. A boat, a lightweight, lap straight boat, handmade in Viking style. From planks they steamed and slowly bent to form this buoyant smile. The strakes were edged and overlapped, rivets driven, plenched. They planed and shaved long winter nights, and now it's time to launch. Each in turn, they row the skiff to laughter, muffled shouts. And then they ask the foreigner, would I care to take her out? It floats, the boat, like a memory. Deja vu come true. Swivels and glides in the dusky light, cork light and slippy smooth. Oh, grandfather, I want to cry, where whispers on the water. But I know how to choke such thoughts. Don't want to be a bother. Rowing backward to the beach, I step from the waking dream with neither Swedish nor English words to venture what I mean. I offer tak and leave them to their triumph, returning up the long, slow hill, thrilled by the curlews crying. The nights are white on Solaron in June. They're gauzy, pale, and we sleep lightly, wake and turn the sheets like tangled sails. Where have we traveled, love, and why? Once, in the night, we kissed. At dawn, we wake to another dream. Dark horses in the mist. And here's a song we found right off that island. <clears throat> uh, I think it was a couple hundred years old, originally a hymn, and then uh, and a song about a girl losing her virginity to a soldier. I think it's called the Rose. And Ross was, I wanted him to be able to sing this song. So I had to come up with my own translation version. So we switched things around a little bit. Um, this tune was made famous, internationally famous, by Jan Johansson. Um, Jazz Posvenska is the CD on which you can find his very stark spare style, just a piano and an upright bass, gorgeous. So it's his voice. Just the one time I saw the girl, and my life was altered forever. Like the wind through the grass she ran, like a sweet cool breeze off the river. She looked at me and she smiled she touched my hand and smiled then she turned and she walked away but she turned and she walked away just the one time i saw the girl and my life was altered forever like the sun she shone on me and I felt a change in the weather. She came for me and she smiled. She touched my face and smiled. Then she turned and she walked away. But she turned and she walked away. Just the one time I saw the girl. And my life was altered forever. Wicked girl, such a girl whose hand touched my hair so I still remember. She froze my heart when she smiled. She stole my soul and smiled. Then she turned and she walked away. But she turned and she walked away. On those uh, visits to Solaron, we were introduced <clears throat> to the uh, summer pasture camps up in the hills. 
Uh, there on the island, they had so little pasturage that um, they boated the cows across the land. And then there would be a band of women who would take them up to uh, the pasture camps, you know, cabins, sheds. And there might be a series of them, even then they would herd the cows through the bogs and the hilly pastures up there all summer long make cheese, whey butter, and all that, and come back triumphantly in the fall with their dairy products, which were very valuable to the village, get them through, went on for centuries. And uh, those women had a life up there. No men. Early feminism. <laughs> Run their own lives. No, occasionally they got to um, get together with some fellows who'd go walking up, you know, on a Saturday night, maybe. But they were, <clears throat> you know. Dawn to Dark and Beyond. Uh, it's a really musical culture. So, uh, you know, they would call out, and this was not just simply kabas. They started playing with it, and then eventually you had, you know, voices like human saxophones. And all day long, these songs would come floating down off the mountains, and old men remembering these would weep that sound, which was now gone, because, of course, we had progress with creamers. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, uh, though they worked most of the time, I'd like to read you about one of those Saturday nights here. This is uh, this set of poems. I should have paid more attention to my brother earlier. He had given me a book called uh, Sing the Cows Home, the Remarkable uh, Herds Women of Sweden. And, uh, that was about 20 years ago. He said, you ought to read this book. I think you'd like it. And finally, I opened it here a couple of years ago. And it generated all kinds of poems. And some of you may have seen uh, Cow Balls and Dollar, another first play we had with folk music here a couple of years ago. <clears throat> this is from that series, Animal Spirits. On Saturdays, we'd air the rooms in hopes that later boys would come. We swept the place with leafy brooms and washed ourselves from hair to bum. We slipped into our cleanest clothes. Alva picked some fragrant flowers, set them here and there, just so, and then we'd reach the witching hour. Voices floated from below as men walked up the mountainside, singing as they came. So strong and low, they made me sort of ache inside. It seemed halfway unnatural. But every group of men fell quiet, standing by the cow corral. They wouldn't come unless invited. Well, these were Dala men, you know. They're pretty nice, but awful shy. A little brown thing made them go, and later you might find out, find out why they were so scared of their desire. We'd give them something good to eat, and soon a fiddler grew inspired. So we all were on our feet. Oh, those nights of summer dancing in the cabins. How we flung ourselves around. We took chances. But aren't you meant to when you're young? Boys from home were nice enough, but I liked mysteries and riddles. Men from elsewhere who would laugh with me or play a wicked fiddle. We went in for lots of teasing. You might mark a man with soot to say you found him pleasing. Some boys would blush, and that was sweet. Sometimes the pair went out of doors toward the woods where moss grew deep. We knew what they were going for. It wasn't just to fall asleep. Well, we were farm girls. We knew life and had our ways to please a boy without a vow to be his wife. There's such a thing as animal joy. We'd been warned by older ladies and some songs that said, take care, the woods are full of crying babies. Who would want hers there? But. Those were lovely times and sweet. Sometimes 
at night, I hear them sing. The madness of our flying feet. And our fiddle note still lingering. So here's a poem inspired by an accordionist at uh, Nisla Stemma. If you haven't been, please come. If you have been, please come again. Is this coming year, the 20th anniversary? 20th anniversary. Second Saturday in June. These guys will be here. They have been on one of the annual t-shirts together. <laughs> yeah, that's right, a red one at that. Uh, can we all agree that this magnificent instrument is vastly underrated, much maligned? Part of our purpose here tonight is to elevate this, this instrument. Yeah. Maria Hart is here tonight. I've collaborated with her on uh, a couple of plays of music, and uh, she coached me long ago. Uh, years ago, the accordion is a wonderful instrument. It covers many sins, stands in for many other instruments. You don't have to pay a whole band or an orchestra so your play might actually be produced. Here's the title poem from the book, Nordic Accordion. In the piney woods of Niswa, in a sunshot glade, in the middle of a rowdy, raucous tune, the fiddle drops out. The bass becomes a heartbeat, and Irena Tirling, all the way from Norway, bends her head and, resting her chin on her accordion, gazes at the buttons arranged beneath her hand, fingers pressing this one, that one, this one, wandering, meandering. And we stop breathing while the origami folds up her black accordion, inhale the fragrant air, and do our breathing for us. Oh, melodious accordion, much maligned, misunderstood, butt of many jokes. That musician in Chicago, who didn't want to leave his accordion in sight on the back seat of his car, but driven by his hunger, went into the restaurant, and coming out, sure enough, 
found his window smashed, but no, nobody had snatched his accordion. But worse, there on the seat beside his instrument, there sat a second accordion. <laughs> jokes of all time. And I'm so proud to have been able to include it. <laughs> oh, pitiful, beautiful, portable, melodian, chest pack, organ, piano on a strap. At last we understand you're a box full of treasure open for our pleasure. And Arena runs the jewelry through her hands. And when the music ends, we give one collective gasp of gratitude for comfort, consolation, life support. Applauding and applauding, we make a sound like water, like an icy mountain stream that falls 500 feet into the fjord.
she's living under very difficult circumstances. I'm not absolutely wild about her poetry. I mean, uh, she's a modernist, and I'm clearly, uh, I don't know what, a recidivist or somebody, <laughs> a preventivist. I like going back to older kinds of things, actually. But uh, her, her, her story touched me. And, uh, I did this poem. Oh, aid it so to grin, I've had it hard. I did not get the place I wanted, felt that I deserved, and so I worked at pointless jobs for years. How I suffered. Hurt by women, I betrayed them in my turn. So, we're the same then. Aren't we, aid it so to grin? My mother's dad, like you, a Swedish Finn, escaped to this America, complaining bitterly, his mother hauling him on by the hand, and where was her husband then? Nowhere. There was illness and death in my family. I drank and made lament. I drank and called some names. I did, etc. And I drank, but then finally at 40, quit. I stopped, although I still complained. I suffered just insufferably. Self-pity so delicious. How could I give it up? But thanks to you, I can, Ava Zodogram. For, though we are alike, we're clearly not the same, since you're a woman, I'm a man, and aging fast, whereas your lovely body died at 31 of the tuberculosis that ate your father when you were 14. Once a year, I catch a cold. I cough and cough. The critics called your writing laughable, while I've won little prizes, Ada Zodogram. War broke down your door. I watch it on TV. You spoon thin soup and dwindle down. I devour chicken, lamb, beefsteak, ham with dollars in my wallet, dollars in the bank. You ran out of paper, sold your furniture and lingerie to go on living, died. Yet here you are in letters and your poems. You said your soul was a light blue dress, the color of the sky. I see you on the shore of Lake Superior late in the spring, when heaps of light blue ice lie shattered on the rocks and clouds of steam drift off the water. I see you there, but then you're gone. I've stopped complaining, David Sodergren. So just stand still and wait for me. I'll bring you meat. I'll bring you writing paper, pen and ink. My wife and I will welcome you. We have an extra room. We like the things you like. Our house has walls of books, and some are Swedish, too. My wife will help you shop for fancy under things. Together, we'll drink tea and just enjoy the cherry trees when they put on their smocks. Or go out in the woods, as you did as a girl. To gather wild berries we can share, or find blood root and wood anemone, or simply stand and breathe the fragrant air. <laughs> Not for Comer. So many of you. We had no idea what to expect. We thought, well, if we get 17, it'll probably be okay here. Thanks very much. It's been a wonderful night for us. Uh, we're going to go into something uh, a little lighter here to really uh, take us all out. And you, this is what you've all been waiting for, a chance to sing along. The chorus is not difficult. You'll pick it up right away. There's no Norwegian in Dickieville, none in the valley, there's none on the hill. There never was and there never will be no Norwegian in
them on the t-shirt.